kind of interesting. I had a, uh, a case this week of a, a patient had a, a knee replacement, and um, he reminded me of something uh, way back when he was in high school. He was a football player uh, at uh, Dover Sherborne High, and uh, when he was a freshman, he attended a banquet, and uh, my dad, who was a football coach, was giving a talk there. And uh, he remembered something that my dad had said in his talk, and he said it stuck with him pretty much for his life. And he kind of reiterated this to me uh, in the office, and again, actually, this week when we operated on him. And uh, what he remembered was that uh, my dad had, had talked about on a football team, the team, the actual team on the field is like the tip of an iceberg. And I feel kind of we're the same way. Uh, the team, the orthopedic team here, we're at the, the top of the iceberg. We're what you see sticking above the water sometimes, at least to our patients a lot of times. But what you don't see is that seven-eighths of the iceberg that's under the water. And you, you folks are the seventh-eighths of the iceberg under the water because without you holding us above the water, we could not do what we do. So uh, first thing, I just want to thank all of you for what you do and for making all of us look so good. <laughs> I did grow up in the Massachusetts area, uh, trained in Boston, and joined Dr. Oliver uh, 25 years ago. He got me down here because he, uh, on a nice spring day, he took me down to the waterfront, showed me all the boats out there, and said, one day you can have one of these. And I, <laughs> I signed right up. I signed right up. So that's why I'm here. So anyway, on to hip. So uh, in a survey that was done uh, of 60 years and older, uh, there's a, the rate of hip pain amongst these patients was about 14%. And actually, there's a couple of studies that's as high as 19%. And these are people with chronic ongoing pain. So generally speaking, if you see someone over the age of 60, there's a pretty darn good chance they're going to have some degree of hip pain, at least from time to time, ongoing. As far as what kind of things we're talking about, uh, arthritis, bursitis, tendonitis, fractures, we all see a lot of that in the, uh, in the, uh, in the OR and in the hospital, ER. Uh, other things such as avascular necrosis or AVN, hip infections or septic hip, uh, and other stuff that even Dr. Reitmeier deals with, labral tears, uh, less, less uh, common things such as tumors that sometimes we will come across as well. And uh, we'll kind of go down that list. But I was going to touch on all of these things, but just want to do some uh, just general talk on this first. Trochanteric bursitis, hip arthritis, uh, and fractures are probably the three most common things we do see. And those are the three most common causes of hip pain. And I can't tell you how many times in the office uh, I'll see a, a half a dozen bursitis pain uh, when we think someone's coming in with either arthritis or something like that. Very common. So first I want to talk a little bit about hip anatomy. And I wish I could be kind of pointing. I'm going to have to kind of turn sideways to do some of this. So the hip joint, it's a ball that fits into a socket. The ball is covered with articular cartilage, which gives that nice smooth surface that the joints move against. Inside the hip joint, or the acetabulum, there also is nice smooth cartilage there. And that's what allows the hip to move smoothly. It's more slippery than an ice skate on ice. Around the socket is a rim of tissue called the labrum, and that kind of seals the socket in and actually uh, provides actually a little bit of suction and helps hold, hold some of that lubricating fluid in place. So that's mainly the area of the hip joint. Now the hip, uh, the ball is on a femoral neck, which is about two inches long, and that's attached to what we call the intertrochanteric area, which is attached to the femur of the thigh bone. Uh, supporting the socket is the pelvic area, including the uh, ischial areas and the pubic rami areas. Other than the bone, there's a lot of supporting muscles. The iliopsoas muscles come down on the front of the hip joint and detach. Those help flex the hip. And on the back of the hip, there's many, many muscles. The outer muscles, the gluteal muscles, there's three layers of that. The maximus, the medius, and the minimus. And then in the back is what we call the short external rotator muscles. Those are the muscles that help externally rotate the hip joint. The most important one we see is the piriformis here. And uh, I'll touch on that a little bit later. Probably the most important thing to try to figure out what's going on is to take a good history and physical exam. Not all of you are docs, but a lot of you are 
nurses here, uh, a lot of physical therapists, and we all kind of do our own evaluation sometimes. And this is true if someone's in the hospital or when your friends talk to you on the side. We all know if you're in the medical profession, any friend you have is taking you aside at some point or another saying, hey, what's this? You know, it cracks when I do that. So, so it's, uh, it's actually good for all of us to know. Most of the time, if you listen to someone, they will tell you what's wrong with them. You don't have to really get too uh, complicated. They, the patients tend to tell you what's wrong if you listen hard enough. What I can tend to fo focus on on the history is whether or not they're gonna tell you this is an acute problem or whether it's a chronic problem. The physical exam oftentimes will tell you where that problem is coming from. So the things we look for in history, the mechanism of injury, if there in fact there was an injury, how long things have been going on, has this been going on for a day, a week, a month, a year, the location of their pain, is it in the front, is it the back, the side, the quality, sharp, dull, stabbing, what makes it worse? You know, if, it, if they sit down or lie down and getting up, does that make it worse? Or is it at nighttime that makes it worse? And other pertinent histories, such as do they have a history of cancer or maybe previous surgery, maybe they had a hip replacement. Maybe they had a history of hip problems as a child. So acute versus chronic. We all know this guy's heading toward an acute hip pain just by looking at this. So it really is important to know whether or not uh, this something has just been going on because there are certain, there are certain things will uh, occur, occur more acutely and certain problems will tend to occur more chronically. Whether the problem is in the joint or whether it's in the supporting structures around the joint, that's important to note also because there's a whole different constellation of uh, problems uh, associated with those. So uh, for acute intra-articular, so this is inside the hip joint. These are the things you think about, hip fractures or septic hip, uh, acute extra-articular, pelvic fractures, contusions, fall and, and hit the side of your hip, uh, muscle or tendon tears common in sports injuries, uh, or referred pain from the back. Sometimes you, someone can have an acute bout of back pain it can refer to the hip area. Chronic pain inside the joint, arthritis, the most common. Avascular necrosis, which is a loss of blood supply to that femoral head, and we'll touch on that a little later. Uh, labral tear, that's something where uh, it can be a sports injury, it can be a chronic injury as well. And the chronic extra-articular things, we see a lot of bursitis, probably the number one. And we lump that together with tendonitis because oftentimes the two are sort of indistinguishable as far as their symptoms. There's also something called that snapping hip, and I can't tell you how many times people have said, hey doc, my hip's going in and out, and they hear a pop or a snap, uh, and that's oftentimes a snapping hip, and that can sometimes be painful, though oftentimes it's not. Uh, something called piriformis syndrome, which I hear a lot of the uh, physical therapists are telling me that someone has all the time, and uh, I'm not sure sometimes what that means, but I will cover that. Uh, and again, referred pain from the back. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, history. So gait is important to note when someone comes in. How are they walking? Do they have a limp? Are they favoring one side versus the other? Do they kind of lurch one way or the other? Do they have dollar bills on the floor when they walk? Uh, uh, range of motion is important. This is not the greatest slide, but I want to show extension, flexion, uh, flexion with rotation, uh, abduction and adduction. All those are important to note as part of an exam. Uh, Trendelenburg sign, this is a test of weakness. Typically, if you ask someone to stand on one leg, and in this case he's standing on his left leg, the right pelvis should go up because the abductor muscles are strong here and they actually elevate the contralateral or opposite side when, you, when you're standing on one leg. In this case, if someone stands on one leg and the other pelvis drops, that's a sign of weakness on the opposite side. So even though the right side is dropping here, it means it's the left side that's weak. So that's important, and that oftentimes will correlate with a limp uh, and instability. So it's important to note that. Uh, tenderness, uh, is it in, in the front of the hip, the side of the hip, the buttock area, is it in the back? Sometimes the location of pain is important to determine what's causing it. Uh, there's some people that feel that uh, if the pain is above the belt line, most likely it is coming from the back. If it's below the belt line, it, it could be coming from the hip or some of the structures around the hip, though it certainly could be coming from the back as well. Leg length issues. Uh, there's two ways we look at this. 
Uh, there's an actual or true leg length difference where someone may have a, a leg that's a little longer, possibly related to a trauma in the past. But also there's an apparent leg length difference. Oftentimes when people have arthritis, they will have what they call a flexion contraction in their hip where they can't straighten one leg out more than the other. And that usually develops over time and oftentimes the people don't even know they have it. Uh, and when that happens, that can throw the pelvis off and it can lead to other problems secondarily too. Uh, this is one of the things I want to show on exam. Uh, one of the things I always do when I examine someone with a hip pain is to go through range of motion, but to flex the hip to about 90 degrees and then internally and externally rotate the hip. Oftentimes that will tell you almost right off whether this is an intra-articular problem or an extra-articular problem, something happening inside the joint or if it's around the joint. The joint itself uh, is uh, held in place with ligaments, what they call the capsule. And the capsule, those, the, uh, the fibers don't just uh, extend straight from one side of the joint to the other. They kind of wrap around that femoral neck. So when you internally rotate, it's almost like taking a towel and wringing it out. So you end up tightening the capsule as you internally rotate the hip. You loosen the capsule when you externally rotate the hip. So if there's pressure inside, say if someone's got arthritis, and a lot of fluid in there, as you internally rotate the hip joint, it actually increases the pressure. That lining of the hip is very sensitive to stretch, so they tend to have a lot more pain uh, oftentimes with internal rotation than with external rotation. And uh, so if someone does have a lot of pain, if you flex their hip and you internally rotate them, that is a sign, that, a very good sign, not totally diagnostic, that it, you're probably dealing with a problem inside the hip joint itself. So specific conditions I want to talk about, and I'm just going to refer back to that list I first uh, uh, mentioned. Arthritis, the most common thing we see as far as hip problems. It's usually in an older crowd, though I have to admit uh, in my practice uh, lately, it seems to me they're becoming uh, early, uh, younger and younger uh, as we do this. Uh, we just operated on a 35-year-old guy uh, this week uh, uh, for a hip problem. So uh, something that we're all seeing. So with hip arthritis, there's a couple of uh, features. The, the uh, surface of the joint is wearing away. You almost get like a cobblestone appearance. Sometimes you get some hip clicking and popping. I liken it to the difference between driving down a nice super highway versus driving down a cobblestone road. So there's a lot of cobblestones in here. Uh, sometimes uh, you can get loose bodies will form as little pieces break off and sometimes can actually grow in the joint. This is an x-ray version of uh, someone with hip arthritis, and what you see is a loss of the joint space. Normally you should see a kind of a clear area here. Uh, as that cartilage wears away, the bones get closer and closer together, and you have basically a loss of the joint space. Uh, your body reacts to that by uh, creating bone cysts, which you see here. It's a reaction to the arthritis, and bone spurs as well. And those can uh, cause actually mechanical blocks to uh, range of motion. Uh, this is usually the end stage of arthritis, and hopefully uh, we can prevent this in most people. So, as far as the history, arthritis tends to be chronic. It does tend to be progressive. Uh, symptoms are usually buttock pain or groin pain, oftentimes reading to the thigh, sometimes down to the knee. Rarely goes below the knee, though occasionally can. Uh, often accompanied by joint stiffness. And if it's been an ongoing problem because people tend to favor that leg over time, there's usually a fair amount of weakness. Uh, that can lead to that positive in Trendelenburg that leads to a limp, uh, like we talked about. On exam, limited range of motion, especially that flexion and internal rotation. Uh, the best test is uh, x-ray. That's probably the gold standard, uh, as you saw from the previous x-ray. The treatment initially is uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, such as ibuprofen or naproxen. Advil Aleve, Tylenol, uh, ice, physical therapy can uh, be very helpful for early arthritis. Uh, the idea behind that is a lot of times with arthritis, as people get loss of range of motion, the limits of that motion will be painful. Physical therapy is very good for sort of extending or expanding that pain-free range of motion. Oftentimes what can happen is as people uh, tend to favor that hip, their motion gets less and less to the point where they get pain even doing everyday activities such as walking up and down stairs or putting on their shoes or socks. So if you can have physical therapy that can increase their comfortable range of motion, 
that can improve their quality of life and actually delay the need for any surgery or other interventions, sometimes for years. Uh, sometimes we'll do a hip injection uh, with cortisone. It doesn't, does not tend to work for long periods of time. Uh, we usually try not to do that, uh, especially if someone is looking at a hip replacement in the future. There's been some studies that show that hip injections uh, can cause uh, increased risk of uh, infections in hip replacements if you do it within three to six months. So uh, if anyone is considering a hip in, uh, replacement, we tend to not do a hip injection. And uh, weight loss is also one of the things we usually try to uh, <laughs> encourage for some of our uh, more rotund patients. Uh, hip bursitis, probably the second most, thing, uh, most common cause of hip pain I see. It's usually pain on the outer side of the hip. Oftentimes people report to me that it hurts them if they sleep on that side, or sometimes if they're not sleeping on that side, uh, if, uh, if they're sleeping on the opposite side, because of the stretch on that affected side, it can be painful. A lot of people report pain just getting up and down from a chair as well. It seems to be one of the hallmarks. There's a lot of uh, bursas around the hip. Now, a bursa is a, a fluid-filled uh, cavity, if you will, uh, that allows one structure to glide more smoothly over another. Picture, if you will, if you had a balloon with a little bit of water in it, you'd be able to roll it around under your hands really easily. So that's what a bursa does. And you, you have them over bony prominences in our elbows, our knees, the sides of our hips. Uh, actually, in the front of our hips as well, where some of the uh, muscles cross the bony prominences, uh, and in the pelvic area as well. Any bursa can become inflamed for a lot of different reasons, from either a trauma or just chronic, uh, chronic rubbing in that area. Sometimes a change in activity level. A lot of times we'll see this with people who, say, have gone on vacation. They live a sedentary lifestyle and they're off to uh, Italy, and all of a sudden, for two weeks, they're walking you know, five miles a day and they come back and they're in a lot of pain. Well, they haven't walked five miles in five years, but uh, that can trigger some of these uh, types of uh, inflammatory processes. So any bony prominence is sort of fair game for something like this. Uh, oftentimes we'll see it on the side of the hip, uh, the trochanteric area here. Uh, there is a, uh, a band called the iliotibial band that all the PT people know about. It starts from the brim of the pelvis crosses over and goes down and attaches just down by the knee. And as you move that hip, that just rubs back and forth over that bony prominence and actually can cause a fair amount of uh, symptoms from that. So hip bursitis, it tends to be more chronic. It could be post-traumatic if someone falls and lands on that side. It tends to be more on the outer side of the hip for trochanteric bursitis, though if you have bursitis in the front of the, uh, the hip joint, the uh, iliopsoas area, can cause pain in the front. Uh, it usually uh, radiates down the side of the thigh. Again, I'm talking about the trochanteric bursitis. Can cause pain while sitting or lying on that side. On exam, there's usually direct tenderness right over that area. The range of motion is usually fairly decent, though some people will have some discomfort at sort of the extremes of range of motion, but usually range of motion is not an issue. Also pain, if you ask them to forcefully abduct or pull their leg out to the side, and if you stretch that iliotibial band, oftentimes that can cause pain. Uh, tests, there's really not a great test for it. Usually x-rays are normal. Occasionally you may see a little spur if someone's got some chronic bursitis or a little calcification. Sometimes MRI can be helpful, uh, and that's more for refractory symptoms, and that typically will do that to determine if it's a bursitis versus a tear of one of the hip abductor muscles, which is actually fairly common as well. Uh, the treatment, usually the same as arthritis typically, non steroidals Tylenol, ice, physical therapy can be very helpful, and I think that's probably one of the mainstays of treatment. Uh, weight loss, if they are overweight. Uh, hip bursa injection, again, that gives some temporary relief. I don't think I've ever cured anyone doing that, but sometimes that can knock their pain from an eight down to a four so they can actually function better. Uh, but like I said, usually it's only temporary. Rarely surgery has been reported, in my experience, uh, has not been that, that helpful. Hip fractures, and this is, uh, I'm not just talking about fractures inside the hip joint, fractures around the hip as well. Uh, this would be someone who would come in, maybe an elderly person, 
maybe had a little fall, uh, didn't seem like much, was walking for a couple of days or a week, had progressive pain, they show up in your office or in the ER. And what you do see is a tiny little fracture right down here in the ischium. Oftentimes you'll see them right along the, the uh, pelvic area here. Uh, most of the time they're stable, but they can be very painful and they can take sometimes months to heal. I can tell you there's one person I've had actually was not even elderly, fell, uh, had a fracture in this area, went on to heal fine. A year later, still having chronic pain from that. So uh, sometimes they can be bad actors that way. Uh, stress fractures, again, talking to that person that went on vacation, did a lot of walking, or maybe someone who's training for the marathon or a, or a road race can develop stress fractures in this area. You can also get them down in this area here. We see that actually sometimes in people who've been on long-term Fosamax treatments or treatment for uh, osteoporosis, sometimes they will get what they call a subtrochanteric stress fracture. They can also be very painful. X-rays can be very helpful for that. Uh, this is more of a traumatic type of an injury. This is what we call a subcapital fracture right under the ball of the hip joint. This is someone who fell and had some pain but able to walk on it. Uh, over time, these things will either heal or they tend to displace. Uh, uh, just had a patient uh, this last week, uh, fell and uh, was able to get up, walk around her uh, apartment, went to bed, woke up the next day, couldn't walk, no new trauma, came to the ER, had a fracture, actually had displaced. And I think most likely she started out with one of these non-displaced fractures that went on to displace. I kind of liken this to, uh, when you get an ice cream and the ice cream's really hard and you put it on your cone, you just kind of crack the top of the cone a little, but the ice cream stays on top, uh, that's this fracture. So you broke the top of the cone, but the ice cream didn't fall off. As opposed to this one where the ice cream is falling off the cone. This is the more typical fracture we see in the ER. Someone who fell, immediately they can't walk, acute pain, very, dis uh, very disabling. Uh, they usually uh, arrive to the ER via ambulance, and this is the type of x-ray we'll see. This is what we call a subcapital fracture. Uh, that's right under the ball to, to be discerned from a, what we call an intertrochanteric fracture, which would be down in this area. This type of fracture usually requires a hip replacement. Uh, fracture down in this area, sometimes we can repair it just because of the way the blood supply to that hip works. So with hip fractures, acute fractures, usually easy to diagnose. There's not too much of a controversy with that. There's usually a history of trauma. Uh, sometimes if someone is uh, demented, you may not get that, or maybe an un unwitnessed fall. The chronic fractures, stress fractures, or insufficiency fractures, a little tougher to diagnose. They usually require some sort of history taking uh, and some type of uh, uh, studies to, to figure that out. Uh, the symptoms can be pain in the buttock area, groin, may radiate down to the thigh, sometimes down to the knee. It's usually pain with weight bearing and with range of motion. On exam, there's usually tenderness, uh, there's pain on motion. Uh, oftentimes with the stress fractures, the pain will be more with active motion than with passive motion. And then x-rays are probably the mainstay of treatment. Occasionally in those stress fractures, you may not be able to see it on x-ray. Uh, in that case, a CT scan. Uh, is usually the next step. And sometimes, as some of the ER people tell you, even CT scans won't pick up some of these fractures. You have to go to an MRI uh, if you still have a high index of suspicion. And usually the MRI will pick that up. Uh, the treatment, uh, if it's an acute fracture uh, that's displaced, is usually surgical. Uh, for some of the others, the stress fracture, sometimes just limited weight bearing uh, and a symptomatic treatment, and these people can go on to heal well. Uh, avascular necrosis, uh, this is uh, a uh, problem with circulation. Uh, it has to do with the anatomy of circulation of that femoral head or the ball. The, uh, the ball is mainly articular cartilage, uh, so it has to get a circulation from just one area as it comes up through that femoral neck. Uh, there are certain things that can cause problems with circulation, certainly a trauma if you have a fracture that can disrupt it. Um, but with that hap when that, that circulation gets disrupted, a portion of the bone dies off, uh, and as part of that, the bone will then resorb and collapse, and that does cause irregularity of the surface of the joint and can lead to an arthritic condition. Here's an example. We just actually operated on the 35-year-old guy this week. This is not him, but uh, normal hip appearing. This uh, gentleman uh, had started having uh, pain in that hip. 
Uh, X-rays are negative. Later on, you can see total uh, destruction of the femoral head uh, where this went on to collapse. And this is someone who would need a hip replacement from that. Causes of avascular necrosis, corticosteroid use. Uh, people say that have uh, asthma or uh, are on, uh, have chronic inflammation. Certain types of uh, arthritic conditions would require that. Uh, alcohol use, high alcohol use, uh, trauma. Um, a hip dislocation, for instance, could disrupt the, uh, the, uh, the blood supply to the head. Uh, sickle cell anemia is known. Uh, chronic conditions such as diabetes, there's a condition called Gaucher's disease, which causes deposition in the bone marrow and actually just clogs off those blood vessels. Gout can do it. Sometimes if you have an acute flare of gout, it actually increases the pressure in the joint to the point where the blood just can't get in there, uh, and that can cause it. And clotting disorders as well, because those vessels clot off. So the history is usually insidious. Uh, you look for a history of corti uh, corticosteroid use, alcohol uh, use, uh, uh, sickle cell like we talked about. The pain, it's very similar to arthritis pain. Uh, so it's pretty much the same. The exam, limited motion, same thing as arthritis. Tests, usually x-ray is the gold standard. Uh, if it's negative, an MRI would be the next step to go for that. That usually shows it very well. And the treatment early on can be uh, anti-inflammatories. Uh, there is a, uh, something called a core decompression where sometimes we'll actually drill holes up in that femoral head to allow blood vessels to grow along the vascular channel to try to get this thing to revascularize. Um, that's got, maybe got a 50-50 uh, chance. And then finally, uh, hip replacement if it goes on to uh, develop uh, collapse. Hip infection could be gradual onset or acute. Usually it's a subacute or acute. Typically we see it evolve over a, a day or a couple of days. Uh, some people, uh, uh, the people who are more prone to this have usually underlying chronic illnesses such as diabetes or renal disease. Uh, IV, IV drug abuse is something you need to look into at least as, uh, as a consideration. It's usually pain in the groin, radiate to the thigh. Again, a lot of these symptoms would be the same. It says intraarticular, so you're gonna get the same type of symptoms as with uh, uh, bad arthritis. Uh, in addition, there may be fevers, chills, malaise, uh, on exam, there's uh, pain on range of motion mainly. Uh, the test, uh, x-ray, may or may not show anything. Sometimes the soft tissue shadows will show swelling around the hip joint. Uh, but really the blood tests are the way to go. Elevated white count, sedate, and elevated CRP. Uh, hip aspiration is probably the gold standard. Uh, looking for uh, uh, elevated white cells in that fluid as well as gram stain and cultures. Uh, sometimes cultures can be negative, and uh, some of the great pretenders of this is gout or pseudogout. Uh, in children, a viral infection known as toxic synovitis can also mimic uh, hip infections. And the treatment usually is uh, urgent surgical drainage for, for something like that. Uh, uh, as you recall, the labrum, that rim of tissue, sometimes that can be torn. That can be a result of uh, a traumatic event. Sports injuries is probably the most common. Uh, and it can occur from what we call uh, femoral acetabular impingement, or FAI. Uh, that has to do with the anatomy of the hip. This is a normal hip. Normally the ball looks like a ball, kind of sitting on a stem. Sometimes what can happen is you can get one of these things that's called a cam lesion, where you've got kind of the, the ball side on here, but it's really flat on this side. So as that hip rotates up, this flat side will, will impinge on the edge of the socket. Uh, Conversely, sometimes you'll have what they call a pincer lesion where the socket is just very pointed here, so when that hip rotates up, this point will kind of dig into the side of the hip. And for the really unlucky ones, they have both. So uh, this is an example of what they call a cam lesion. You can see the normal femoral head, neck contour here, and as you come around, it's just very flattened on this side. So if this person brings the, the head way up, it's gonna pinch, and you can actually see a little calcification from chronic irritation there. This uh, is an MRI of, of what looks like that as well. You can see a tear. This sh th there should not be any fluid tracking into this area here, and that's usually a sign of a uh, tear of the labrum. This is something you oftentimes see with uh, people who uh, do activities that involve hyperflexion of their hips or in sports activities where there's a lot of hyperflexion of the hips. Uh, this is a test where they call it an impingement test where you flex the hip, you adduct, and you internally rotate, and that will uh, cause that impingement, and if that's positive, you have a high suspicion for that. And uh, 
Usually the, the, treat, the uh, diagnosis for that is an MRI arthrogram where they inject some dye into the hip. Uh, and the treatment can be uh, anti-inflammatories, activity uh, limitation, physical therapy can be helpful, and sometimes hip arthroscopy to remove or trim down some of those lesions. Uh, just to touch on a few other things, hip tumor is something you always want to be aware of, especially with chronic pain. Uh, this is an example of someone, a benign tumor of uh, the intertrochanteric area. Uh, it's uh, a problem just because of its sheer size, it causes weakness and that can cause pain and it can cause a pathologic fracture. This, uh, the most common form is a metastatic tumor and this is an example of that on an MRI where that can actually invade the, the femoral head or neck or intertrochanteric area. And if that, it's big enough, that can cause a fracture, and oftentimes we have to prophylactically treat these. This would be something you'd do a hip replacement for. On this one, you can kind of graft and put in some kind of ex, uh, internal support. Snapping hip, we all know about that, and that usually is a muscle band or tendon that's snapping over a bony prominence. In this case, it's a prominence in the front of the hip joint, in the front of that pelvis. As this hip swings back and forth, this kind of goes back and forth that way and uh, oftentimes can snap, and if it gets, if it happens enough, you can actually just cause some irritation. There is a bursa in there, it can cause some bursitis in that location. One of the more common ones is the iliotibial band as, as it comes over the bony prominence of the uh, greater trochanter also can cause some snapping, and that'd be one where if someone kind of sticks their hip out to the side and they kind of rotate around and they say, oh look, my hip's going in and out, that's actually that iliotibial band snapping over that, uh, that area. Uh, SI joint, uh, that's usually uh, uh, as a result of uh, pain in the sacroiliac regions, can be one side or the other, usually as a result of abnormal stresses. Oftentimes can be related to a leg length discrepancy where there's more weight on one side or the other. The pain distribution is more buttock, sometimes down the side, actually can occasionally radiate down the leg. Uh, and sometimes that's difficult to uh, differentiate from uh, other things such as piriformis syndrome. Uh, anyone in uh, PT people ever diagnosed piriformis syndrome? Any of our physical therapy friends out here? No, come on, I know you all have, yeah, all right. So this is something, sometimes a uh, diagnosis of exclusion. This is the normal anatomy of uh, the sciatic nerve where it comes out under the piriformis. Occasionally, you can get a situation where part of the nerve or all of the nerve will actually aber aberrantly come through that muscle, and as that muscle contracts, it just squeezes that nerve, can kink it, and it can cause symptoms basically identical to sciatica. It's usually something that's very hard to diagnose, uh, and the treatment for that usually is physical therapy to stretch that area out. Finally, I know Dr. Leck is gonna touch on this, is a disc herniation or back problems can oftentimes cause pain, and depending on the level, you can have buttock pain, you can have pain on the side that can mimic bursitis, you can have pain kind of radiating to the front and the thigh that can mimic uh, arthritis sometimes too. And uh, there's been several occasions where Dr. Lecky has sent me patients with uh, both hip pain or hip arthritis and back problems. And there's several times I've sent him patients with the identical because we can't sometimes figure out exactly where most of their pain is coming from. So sort of in summary, uh, hip problems are very common, 14 to 15% of the population. Uh, most of it, uh, trying to figure out what's going on is just a high index of suspicion, knowing the things that can cause those problems, doing a good history, a good physical exam, and listening to the patient, and most of the time they will tell you what is going on. So thank you very much.